Rob Cameron here. I'm a technical director of infrastructure at Roblox. And we want to tell a little bit of the story about how we took uh, and migrated from Windows infrastructure to Ubuntu for our game servers in seven days using Mass. So a little bit of a background, just a funny story about Mass. So I worked at a startup once, and I'm sure most of you maybe have started with that story as well. And we needed to build some imaging systems. So the team was like, yeah, here's the requirements. And the requirements kept on growing and growing and growing. So I built this awesome system. It was, it was like pirate themed. And like the main system that booted was called Booty Box. And super fun and exciting. And then we got it. I delivered it. I showed it to the team. And the CTO was like, you see this Mass thing that like that just came out? Like, what do you mean? Like, it's just what you did, but good. I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, so ever since then, uh, when I get an opportunity to use imaging, I've always uh, used Mass. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, first of all, let me just talk a little bit about what Roblox is. Um, much like myself, when I went to start and was uh, you know, talking to the company, I said, what the heck is a Roblox? Is it Rob plus blocks? I love both. Um, it's a massively multiplayer and online game creation system. So we basically create a cloud and a platform where developers can create games of anything that they want to do within 3D worlds, 2D worlds, things like that. Uh, and then from there, players can come on, play, play together. We have great matchmaking where if you have a friend in Spain and you're here in California, we'll do equidistance matching for latency. Really fun like that. So you're never worried about where you're at in the world to have that type of experience. <clears throat> but besides being able to play the games, you can also create, publish, and monetize them. So right now, any, everybody could run out of the room, create a game, publish it, and be able to generate revenue off of it yourself. And we pay developers much like something like Apple would pay the App Store uh, revenue out to the developers. Uh, and currently, we have over 100 million monthly active users, which is a great milestone for us. When I originally started writing this talk for a different conference, we started at 70, and then we got to 90, and today we're at 100. So I'm sure by the end of the year, it'll be more than that. And from the game perspective, there's all sorts of types of games, from like dungeon games, which I show on here, like a Sims type of game, Bloxburg, all the way to a game of working at a pizza place. Now, this is a game that we've had around for 10 years, and it seems ridiculous. Like, why would I want to work at a pizza place? But it's actually a really fun game of just interacting socially, doing teamwork to deliver pizzas, stuff like that. And the thing is, is at the end of the day, like, there's a lot of different experiences that kids can have. Again, when, whether they're escaping prison or working, making pizza or just hanging out with some friends in town. And a little bit more background about myself. Uh, again, Rob Cameron, a technical director here at Roblox. Uh, I, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm really passionate about my work. And what I love about working at Roblox or gaming companies, which is where I've shifted my focus here in the last you know, five years, is games are a completely optional solution, right? I used to sh sell sheet metal boxes for Juniper, which was super fun and like high-end routing and performance and firewalls. But in the end of the day, like you kind of have to buy a sheet metal box where somebody on, on nights and weekends or, or kids, like they can kind of choose what they want to do. So it just adds a little bit more of a challenge to uh, the customer because one day you could launch a game, have a huge player base, and then tomorrow something better comes out and customers will move instantly. Where with buying sheet metal boxes, you're kind of stuck and you have to keep on using them and buying them. So when I came on board uh, December 17, which seems like yesterday, but it's now almost two years, my goal was simple. I want, the goal was to migrate of all of our Windows game servers over into Linux. Seems easy enough. So, so what, are, what are the goals around why we wanted to do it? First of all, with the way we were using Windows, we're using it effectively as a, just a basic you know, operating system. We're not using Windows-specific feature sets. So we're spending a lot of money on licensing that wasn't providing value to us or to our players. Um, again, it seems weird. Well, why would you build Windows at scale? A lot of gaming infrastructure, a lot of gaming developments on Windows, so it's a very natural evolution. So that's where we had grown into. The other part is, is we wanted to migrate over to 64-bit to provide enhanced uh, uh, capabilities for our players. Things that we've added since we've moved to Linux is the ability to create 100-player game servers. So in the past, you could be limited to 8 or 20, but now you could create your own Fortnite-like game or a, a Battle Royale game with up to 100 players. And then when I was brought on board, you've got 24 months to, to kind of lead this process. Seems fun. I love Linux. I love gaming. Let, let's do it. So boom, I start. So when we started, first thing and the most important part was, where are we going to look at for our Linux distribution? And for doing this, you know, 
you can install Linux. There's lots of different uh, variants and distributions. But the thing that matters the most is the core of the operating system is the kernel. You want to have things that are up to date, especially when using containerization to get the best C group performance and various fixes. Um, we had done some work and, and still have some, uh, some CentOS-based boxes, or like I like to call it the Red Menace. Um, and we're running it. We still have all these issues because the kernel is just so old and getting patches and stuff is a pain. Uh, with, with, uh, with what our choice was with Canonical and Ubuntu, um, we're able to have all those different types of kernels without having to compile it. In the past, previous to my time at Roblox, we actually used to compile and distribute our own kernel internally to do different things, and we don't need to do that particularly anymore. Um, the other part is, is we have servers that are live on the internet 24-7 every day of the year, of course, and we want to make something we can have patch rapidly and being able to keep up to date. Uh, and it's something that, again, it's not like we have two, 300 people managing this infrastructure. We need a company that can kind of, we can rely upon to do that, and Canonical has provided that for us through the Ubuntu distribution. Uh, and then lastly, uh, as we're doing this, we want to ensure that as our needs develop, the needs of the, uh, the tools we're using, including Linux, develops with us. And so we found, felt that the roadmap and pipeline was really good for that. Um, and as doing so, we really want to think about always all the Linux stuff and technology is great, but what's the end game for really benefiting and helping our players? So the first thing we wanted to do is we had used a lot of different outsource uh, cloud providers, um, which are smaller names that aren't like particularly like AWS, to be able to provide edge compute or, po or points of presence throughout the world. Because we don't care where you're playing or you want to play from, we want to give you the best possible experience. So if you're in Southeast Asia, if you're in the United States, if you're in Europe, in South America, we want that gaming experience to be strong and have low latency. So we needed to provide that and build the edge compute out. And in doing so, we need thousands and thousands of servers. So we wanted to take the server management and make it simple. Because again, we're not going to have 100 people being able to manage this. We wanted to be able to provide an API to do everything, even if we weren't able to use the API right away. We wanted something where we could have full lifecycle management of the server and being able to do new software releases and configuration management. These were things that were kind of a problem for us in the past, where it might take you know days, or actually like, I think our first Windows upgrade we ever did took about two years to get through. Um, which is something we don't have time for anymore. The other part is when we're doing software releases in the past, it could take hours and hours or maybe even a day to do a software release globally, which again, wasn't so bad, but like as we scale up systems, that again, uh, may, the time might grow exponentially. So we needed to think about like when we went to this project, how can we solve these particular problems? And uh, like uh, Exhibit once had said, infrastructure needs infrastructure. We can't just go ahead and like, hey, we roll out some computers in a pop and like they just show up in some, some location and it just works. We need tooling to be able to manage that tooling. And so one of the parts here was being able to deploy, re-image, and manage the servers uh, very rapidly. And so that's something, and we'll talk a little bit more about, we, we decided to use Mass for. Uh, a great engineer I work with, Adam Beeman, he, he was somebody who was already on top of this before I had started. So luckily, like, I was able to uh, use that as part of my solution. Didn't have to do a lot of internal convincing uh, for what to be able to do that. Because in the end, uh, when I've worked at other gaming companies, we've had issues like with a game server. So then you take the, the issue, it goes into a ticket queue, somebody looks at it, yeah, it's broken. And then it goes to another queue and another queue. In the end, you're just managing one server, just re-image the thing. We wanted to be able to have that simplicity for management overall. And then most importantly here is we have to have services that run on top of the, game, the, the system to be able to deploy and start and manage new game instances. So how are we going to be able to put that on the boxes? Before, we were doing a very simple copy and replication uh, scripting setup. Uh, but maybe we could do something a little bit better for that. So I'd mentioned uh, managing uh, with mass. So mass is something, again, uh, unfortunately, like my, my ill-fated booty box and pirate-themed uh, fun, uh, is something that manages the entire life cycle of the box. Uh, we had some great slides earlier that really drilled down into this of being able to image the box, reboot it, recycle, and reuse. And what's important is that uh, you know we don't want to be in a situation where myself or just one person knows how to operate this. We want somebody thing we can onboard people very rapidly, people who maybe never use Linux, people who have never imaged a server by hand, I don't know. But we want it to be easy, or as I like to say, so easy you cannot not do it. Uh, and so using Mass, and again, with my experience before, like very happy with how that's able to manage all of our systems. Um, 
we were able to rapidly roll out all of the different sites, which we'll talk about, because of the power of mass. And we continuously use it today. I think as of like the moment, uh, we're at like 16 or 18 different locations for it. Um, and again, as we build it up, it's like very simple for us to roll out and manage that. Um, with kernel selection, we ran into this uh, C group bug, which I would, was going to make a slide to talk about that specific bug, but um, it was something that we had an issue where basically you'd run of, of, of a number of C groups as the C groups in memory would leak. And so this was something we experienced in CentOS and the kernel 310. Uh, that was fixed in 4.15.42, I think, or 52 in Ubuntu, but ultimately chose to go with the hardware enablement kernel of 4.18 as we were buying some new hardware and had a better driver support for us. And that allowed us to standardize and like very simply switch to that uh, across the board. I believe we initially had rolled out with 4.4, which did have the bug, so after n number of days, the box could effectively no, no longer create containers uh, correctly, and so this was able to uh, help and enhance and solve that for us. And when we're building and deploying things, like every optimization you can input into the system matters. Because in the end, like when you're building something, that is your best time to impact change up front before the system is live in production. So we wanted to make sure that, again, going forward with mass, maybe there's APIs in there we don't particularly use or feature sets we don't use extensively. Like maybe we could do more with um, uh, commissioning scripts or how we patch driver or patch uh, firmware and things like that. But because all of the capabilities were there, when the time comes to have to use those, that tooling, it's available. And we don't have to you know, go out of our way and reinvent the wheel. Because again, you know, nothing's ever in, you know, you're building something and it's not production. But again, as soon as it's up and running and somebody's using it, it's probably production forever. And then for imaging the systems, what we wanted to do is provide a cloud-like experience. So I, I kind of relate this to basically AWS, right? Easy ability to create machines, destroy machines, that type of life cycle. And I feel that Terraform does a great job for that, for not only imaging or, or whatnot, but, but across the board for all of the things. And so we wanted to use Terraform for being able to provide that and manage that life cycle. So at my previous company, I had worked on a fork of this te mass Terraform provider, uh, and then forked it again, brought it over here. Uh, I'd submitted all my changes up to the master, which is listed there. And then we've recently just gone ahead and fully refactored this to match with Terraform uh, 12 support, um, and then be, be kind of uh, fix a bunch of bugs and things like that. And I believe we've started adding uh, VM support for it, which is, was new in uh, Mass 2.5. Um, which is awesome, because that way, instead of just imaging a bare metal host, we could take a bare metal host and then image VMs on top of it with using the same tool set, using the same workflow. So f feel free to, to take, download, commit, and, uh, and or file issues, uh, as there's always things that could be done better for it. But this life cycle has, I think, been very helpful for us because it takes us and allows us to inject uh, user data, which then we can use to bootstrap Chef, and then from there, Chef can go ahead and take on and, and do the rest of the configuration management for us. Um, and then we had uh, some, we have some plans to either use maybe potentially Terraform Enterprise or maybe Jenkins or Circle CI to kind of uh, continuously uh, optimize the workflow for using that tool. So when we looked at building and deploying software in 2018, uh, I think kind of containers generally solves a lot of issues for us. Um, one of the things we had in the past was if we wanted to patch a server, right, patch servers. We may, at the time, I think we had about 15,000 Windows servers. That's a lot of stuff to patch. It's not like necessarily we can just say, hey, let's patch the server anytime we want. We have active uh, live games on it. We have players on it. So we have to disable or drain the node. That may take hours to do. It's just generally a lot of work, right, to be able to do that. So we ran into challenges with developers where they're like, hey, we're always updating our libraries. We want to do things differently. So I think like containers really made, made sense for us across the board. Let the developers pick their open SSL library and not have to upgrade the fleet for it. And we can just patch effectively the container and not the, uh, not the OS. Um, when we had started this project, we had literally zero Docker containers, anything running in production. And again, mo uh, mostly everything was Linux as well. Uh, a bunch of, I'm sorry, mostly everything was Windows as well. I think like 95% plus. Um, we had some other stuff in like Redis or Memcache as Linux. Um, so this was new. And so bringing people on board and kind of explaining the power of containers like was, was a little bit difficult at first, but over time, as people got to use it and experience the, uh, the life cycle and the workflow, of course, they just jumped on board with it. 
The other parts are is being able to provide strict security controls, or at least some limited security controls to begin with, and then we're working on stricter stuff in the future. Um, being able to limit memory, so that way a single uh, game instance can't blow up and, and, and blow up a box. Now here's the thing. For a lot of gaming companies, they're building a game, and they have the similar game loop. Five, 10, 100 people join, the game instance starts, the game instance runs, the game instance ends, and there's like a very fixed compute window, meaning that games are going to have a specific average, they're going to have a specific load, and a specific memory footprint. Our game catalog currently has like 26 million games, which again, there's you know really like a top thousand out of the top thousand, really a top hundred. So at any time, any server in any game instance could run a completely different workload. So you could have one game, which is two people having a tea party, or uh, one which is my favorite, somebody recreates Simpson scenes and you can just watch it kind of like a video, which is fun. Um, or you could have a 100-player game that's doing like you know, a, a, a first-person shooter that's you know, real-time or near real-time. So we can constrain all of those different requirements for the different container types and have different like, classes of running the instances. And then we can prevent that container from blowing up the system. When I had just first started, we ran into a bug where there was an infinite loop or some sort of issue like that, and we had to reset all of the game instances. In this case now, we limit so the OS can't be taken over, and we restrict what the container can do uh, within reasonable means. And then also I kept on saying kernel, kernel, kernel. In containers, as we know, uh, the, def the default way is that everything's in a shared kernel. So the kernel and its performance really matters because, again, that impacts not only just uh, the, you know, the game and all of that, but players. Now, our average player base, which I maybe failed to mention earlier, is from uh, age 9 to 12. So we know how challenging it could be to deal with our customers, you know, that we may have uh, people's customers in the rooms or customers we've had in the past. How do you explain to a 9 to 12-year-old that the kernel isn't working optimally? I don't know. And, and, I, and I can tell you, we literally do get support tickets from kids who are like, I couldn't play today, and I did all my chores, and I'm sad. <laughs> it's not actionable, but it makes us really sad, right? So when we have issues, you know, we can have banners and tell people what's going on, which we definitely do for the developers who build on top of our platform. But for a kid, they're just sad, right? And I don't want that. I want them to be able to play and interact with their, their friends and, and whatnot. So that's why, like, when we're building this, like, every element of this stack is really important to provide that stability and capability for the platform. So with running with containers, um, it's really cool to manage you know, thousands of nodes and have containers, but we don't want to do that manually. We don't want and things like Chef could potentially do deployments for us, stuff like that, but we want to have really a symphony of orchestration for all of the different components that come together. We want a simplified method for updating jobs or updating tasks, deploying containers, deploying secrets, managing configuration, and so on and so forth. So at the time, I looked at the, uh, four, the big four, as I called it, Swarm, Kubernetes, Nomad, and uh, DCOS uh, uh, slash Mesos uh, for what we could do. I've had previous experience with all of them um, and kind of said, like, what are the requirements that we actually need to meet? So we had some weird requirements here, which is we need something that works on Windows as well as Linux. Again, I, the whole thing here is like, let's get rid of Windows and move to Linux. But of course, there's still other stuff in the platform, which are legacy services that need to run on top of uh, Windows and probably will need to for some time. So that put us into an interesting conundrum of like, what do we really choose? The other part is, is when I build this, I don't want to build it and have to wait, stay awake 24-7 or take, you know, to onboard somebody uh, to operate this six, nine months to get it to work. I want somebody who I can take, you know, who may be in the org, who might be an older Windows admin or older as in, uh, you know, they've been doing that for a while, and just bring them on board, give them 30, 40 minutes and get them on board, uh, up to speed with it. And then lastly, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't have huge staffing requirements post-deployment. So that way we're saying, oh, great, we have this cool thing, but now we need to hire 10 people or we're going to explode in you know, the next month. So as part of that decision, uh, I ended up choosing the HashiStack with the organization. Uh, HashiStack, which I like to call, is, it includes all the HashiCorp tools, but for particularly here, it's Nomad, Console, and Vault. So console for service discovery, uh, APIs for doing uh, service registration, DNS is an API to, do, to read and see the information there. Uh, HashiCorp Vault, which provides secret management as a basic feature, but also full PKI support, managing all the certificates, creating dynamic certificates. It, it does a ton of stuff. It's, honestly, it's a phenomenal product and could be used in, in many different ways. Uh, and then lastly, to operate and manage our containers, we chose Nomad. 
And what I liked about Nomad is Mac, uh, Mac Windows Linux support, uh, very easy to operate. Uh, we could bring people online and within 30 minutes, you know, get them to understand how it works. Within a few days, get them operating it. Within a week, they can do production upgrades where if they screw up, everybody's split down. So no, no pressure on them, but like we're able to do that. And we did bring on some, uh, a great gentleman, Vernon. He came on board, Active Directory guy, like super smart, super hilarious. And then we've got him upgrading in production, you know, that if he, again, brought this down, you know, millions of players would be disconnected. So it's awesome to be able to have that. Um, as something that's not part of the suite or the hashi stack that I've lifted he listed here is a tool called Portworks, which is a container storage layer, uh, one of many that are out there. But what I really liked about it, it was just zero touch operations and a great, great, excellent support from the organization. We initially deployed it as doing a POC and did basically everything you're not supposed to do, uh, you know, which again, like happens. Uh, and we use like um, loopback file systems and weird stuff. And the team at Portworks was able to like help us migrate out, made some features to be able to move forward with it. And since we've deployed it, again, knock on wood as always, uh, just super solid and, and easy to operate. So these are the components that effectively power all of our sites for all of our games. So after we kind of made some of these decisions, we're like, hey, this is really good. And like the cost savings is excellent. Like, thumbs up, of course. So maybe we could get that a little bit sooner than uh, two, two years. So it was bumped, you know, a couple quarters, it was bumped a couple quarters, and then, well, in the end, instead of two years, I had around 10 months to get this out the door. Um, by doing so, we saved, uh, well, let's just say, a lot of money on Windows licensing, a lot of operational uh, parts of, uh, that were, were, were fixed, as well as ultimately, again, coming down to money to deliver it. So this was a little bit stressful to be able to see that, but I said, hey, you know, I'm not in this alone. I'm helping architect this, but let's bring the team together and see what we can do. So we said, hey, we're going to deploy this solution globally. This is a rough estimate of what the footprint looks like for our sites, and I think it's changed a bit as we've added more sites here. These are all the different locations that we need to, to be able to launch by October 31st. So we're now like March, uh, February, March, April maybe that we've decided this. Um, we have some locations where we have a private edge computer or POPs. Uh, we have locations where we burst to AWS. There's just definitely a lot of stuff going on. Uh, we also have a global backbone, uh, global internet connectivity, all of these various things. Now, a lot of folks, uh, you know, I want to address this, like, are heavily reliant on cloud. And that's awesome, because cloud is freaking incredible. I remember I went to uh, Data Center World or LinuxCon or something, like, you know, 12, 14 years ago, and they were demoing AWS. I'm like, what? Like, it used to take it back then, you know, up to 12 weeks to get a new server, you know, order it, rack, stack, cabled, and that was the very old way of doing it. So AWS and, and other cloud providers, super powerful. But the thing is, is while we're doing gaming, effectively what we're doing is we're reselling compute, right? At the, you know, at the core of it that's not sexy or exciting. And so if we're doing so, we want to do it in the most cost-effective way so we can pass that type of savings onto the player and be able to have more accessibility. And so that drove us to build all of our, our POPs, or really I, th I think we can generally kind of call it edge compute today. And I think going forward, you know, many companies can kind of benefit from that to be able to be closer to your customer or to your player to provide that best type of experience. And so that was a, a huge part of, of the deployment here. Uh, I think, again, I mentioned, like, maybe we're going to get by, by about 20 sites by the end of the year, and we'll have a new updated map. Now, the technical meat here is, like, how are we going to build and deploy this in such a rapid uh, amount of time, right? We're changing not only just, you know, Windows to Linux, but the operational model for a company that's been in business for around 10 years, right? So we need to be able to make this easy to use, fast to spin up a site. I mean, reasonably fast. We don't need to do it in like 10 minutes or something, although that would be nice, maybe something to do next year. But we want to do something that's just very simple to kind of spin it up. Oop. So uh, sorry, the animations uh, went away for that. So what we have is we have regional data centers within, you know, within our major locations with major continents. And then from there, we connect that over to the backbone. We power you know, parts of this in the regional data center by Nomad, Console, Vault, and then Portworks for our stable storage. We connect one of our points of presence or POPs over the backbone, and from there, we split our compute up into two locations, private and public. The idea being is that public servers, excuse me, are all of where the games are going to be played and, and are generally exposed. 
The private servers are the ones that are going to run, uh, that are going to be isolated, protected, and provide the control plane services to manage the public servers. So what we did is we spun up uh, regional locations, and then from there had uh, regional uh, nodes from Nomad run inside of each of the pops. And on top of that, we run the HashiStack itself on HashiStack, very exhibit-like, uh, and to be able to, to spin it up. Uh, this is ideal because it allows us to deploy a pop extremely quickly, manage the, com the container lifecycle, and then, of course, as well as being able to do th really cool things you can do in Nomad, where we can cycle certificates all the time, uh, scale uh, services, scale different, uh, different things like that. Other components we run in here, like the tick stack for monitoring and other uh, network monitoring tools that run on top of the Nomad client. So it gave us a lot of ability to do that. Where before, we were very strict on like one server, one purpose, where now we can take servers and do multi... Uh, use them for multiple things, which is awesome. Uh, and then on the game server side, those are again are all managed by the private side. Pretty easy overall. Uh, there are some things here again that uh, you know probably could have been better in how we operated it, but we're now coming on uh, almost a year for this being in production, and it's generally run really well for us. Uh, I've never written a line of code I didn't want to rewrite the next month, or I've never deployed something that I didn't wish I could de deploy again with better automation. So over time, we're going to continuously sharpening the razor and optimizing the solution and the design overall. So we have the design, we kind of have everything up, we need to build our first site, we want to get it right. And so I can tell you I built our San Jose site, I think, you know, like 60 times, like build it up, tear it down, document, figure it out, just validating that all of these steps uh, we can move forward with very easily. Because the problem is, is again, while there's always the idea in the future, we're going to come back and optimize this and make it better. The reality is, is we put something in production, and sometimes it just has to be production because priorities shift. So I wanted to make sure in this cycle we could ensure that uh, everything was as good as it possibly could be for the time. And then we wanted to also ensure that there was fairly good documentation, which could have been better, but I'll explain what happened there. And we wanted to also make sure that there was good code review for all the processes. So I alone, of course, cannot operate all this by myself, so I wanted to make sure that as we did this, we, you know, ensured that what I was saying made sense. And I think that's kind of a, what I like to call as the creator's dilemma, right? You can make and design something, and you know it intimately, right? You know each system call, or you know each uh, line of code, or each function, and then you're like, oh, this is easy to operate. I can't, you guys are idiots. I don't understand it. And, and I don't want to fall into that trap. So I wanted to make sure we could share, get good feedback, and ensure that that process is through, would be done through like a code review type of solution. So as we went through this, we made uh, decisions around how we were going to build it, how we are going to launch it. We prototyped the site. We had some boxes running. Uh, everything looked good. Um, the hard part here is we wanted to in, in, uh, identify and just tell everybody who could be impacted and what's going to happen. Because again, we're making the biggest infrastructure change we've done maybe in history, I don't know, just at least in a while. And so we don't want anybody to be freaked out when you know, Linux comes on board and things are different. Because that's the worst, right? Like you get, you're doing your work every day, you have a process, maybe a build pipeline, whatever it is, and then I come in and I say, oh yeah, all well, that's gone and there's a whole new world and you don't know anything about it. That makes you feel really vulnerable and really scared, right? You're on call for this stuff, can you really manage it? So we had to go through a lot of effort to keep to educate people and make sure people uh, you know, weren't, weren't scared about it and weren't impacted negatively. Uh, of course, we needed to schedule all the changes and where we're going to roll it out. And then importantly, uh, what I got to do this was super fun. I got to write some of the game launch code. So every time a container spins up and we want to start a new instance of, uh, of the game instances, I was able to write the, at least the initial code for it, which was super exciting for me to be able to do. Because each instance of a game server runs, of course, in a container. Makes sense, right? Because from there, instead of before where we had to push and, and push everything up to each server or how we wanted to roll it out, we could now just simply say, hey, let's start a new container. And boom, instead of having to pre-deploy the services, the container is automatically pulled and then brought into the infrastructure. So this gave a lot of uh, agility to the company. Like, so as we want to roll out a, a new release or a new patch, we're able to do that almost like, instantaneously of how we want to update it. Or in cases where we want to run Canary services for validation, we can say, hey, these 25 nodes, they're only going to run version X and then be able to bring all of that up. So it was just really super exciting. Um, we had looked at and kind of hoped that with this solution, we could do a full deployment in about, uh, or full uh, software release globally, so in about like a few hours. Um, but we were able to do even better than that. So now we're talking, this is actually about just a year ago. And we're really excited and I'm pushing really hard. And well, life sometimes is a bit like juggling. So I woke up one morning and I'm like, okay, 
we got this, we're going to do another day, and I go to grab a glass of water, and I, oh, it's like just killing me. Like, it's just like, whoa, it's supposed to. It's like lava, it's just killing me. So we've got to go to the hospital. Well, it ends up that you cannot personally sustain your life for many months on coffee, monster energy drinks, and uh, protein bars. It just doesn't work out. Now, now, again, it does work for some time, but then there's just that day where it just doesn't work out. And that day was this, that day. And actually, it's a, a week ago, or this week, a year ago, is when it happened. So it's great to be able to tell this story. Now, this wasn't something like Roblox was behind the scenes with a whip beating me. I just really care. I was really passionate to get it done. I was doing all I could. But it was too much, and it was time uh, my body said, no, can't do it. Uh, and previously, in my old company, uh, super stressful, so I used to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. I had quit from this job, and I'm 22 months clean on that, so that's great. Uh, and then uh, from the coffee side and stuff, well, I'd just say I toned that down a bit. It ultimately took me around six months to fully recover from what happened. Uh, I ended up having multiple ulcers and other stuff that's not awesome to talk about. So again, uh, be passionate about your job, but realize uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Now, what's, what's really pivotal to me here in the Roblox story is it wasn't like they just called me up and said, you're, you're boned, you can't do this, it's over. The team came together to make this happen and push forward towards that October 31st date. They were able to come in and jump in things that, you know, again, I was specialized in that I could I hand it off or I couldn't hand off. And it took me um, maybe about a couple weeks to get back fully to work. Um, and, and I would work a few hours a day to help people move forward. But when that time came where we needed to launch, we were, we were going to be ready. Now, to meet our deadline, we had eight, we had eight sites <clears throat> that we needed to roll out at the time. And we literally had eight days to do it, right? So I said seven days or less, but uh, we'll, just, we'll just say we had to do with eight sites with eight days. So sorry, be a little, little uh, facetious with the title here. So every day we had the plan. We would wake up. Uh, my, my manager, Craig, at the time would start doing the imaging during the day. I would have prepped the site the night before. Uh, the game ops team and Adam Beeman, who would have set up mass and everything. And we pounded through site after site day after day to be able to launch it. And it's, it was challenging, right? Because as we know, like no matter how much preparation you have, no matter what you do, there's always stuff that can happen. So of course, uh, you know, I was going to do the documentation while well, I, I could, and I was sick. So I couldn't write that. So I gave a lot of people the information I could and went back and helped be able to help that. But that was definitely a huge hindrance for us. Um, due to the lack of documentation, I didn't explain fully how to roll out certs. So we had some sites we rolled out with certs that were good for seven days. So on the eighth day, it wasn't so awesome for that site, but we, you know, we fixed that and managed it. And then lastly, you know, I don't, even, I don't know. It's always the case. There's always something with DNS. We had some conflicting documentation around which DNS to use and whatnot, and so that caused some issues and pops. But once we, you know, worked it out and came together, the penguin has landed. So from that initial launch, we went from zero containers in production, nothing, right, to up to 200,000 active containers. Now over the, and that was at max testing. Today, I think we're three to 350,000 containers. So like right now, globally, 300,000 containers are running with millions of people playing games on them, powered by Ubuntu and the HashiStack. The day we launched, when I, or the week we launched, we launched 5,000 hosts within those, within those uh, eight days. Today, we're up to 10,000, and next year, that could even double. Now, again, these are very beefy boxes, lots of RAM, lots of cores, and we have an awesome hardware team that's going through and breaking that down, so how can we optimize that? Could we do different processors, different things? And that's what I love is, right, with technologies. You could always make it better. Next month, there might be a new feature. There might be a new chip. There might be something else that we can squeeze more performance. I love it. But when we went from Windows to Linux, because of that 64-bit migration, some other tweaks, the servers that were running games on it now are running 50% to 100% more workload, which is awesome. So not only did we save money on Windows, but we basically just got a bunch of free hardware that we didn't have to install that was already there. We also now had a path to orchestration, so that way we had a way to run other containerized workloads, which we definitely do today with Nomad and the HashiStack. And all of our future apps can now be containerized. Uh, I think that's, you know, should have an asterisk after it, because here's the thing, like Kubernetes, Nomad, Swarm, DCOS, I don't care. Changing the company to think about applications and containers, getting those build cycle, those build workflows out there, like it's a lot of work and a lot of education. So that's something that we're still working on, and you know, I honestly will be working on that for the next five years as we complete our global migration of our platform as well over to Linux. Um, 
But to me, the thing that at the end is like, we, you know, we, I've been doing this for a long time, a lot of different technical solutions. It was just seeing the team come together. And then also being able to build a new team uh, on top of that uh, in the organization to kind of own this and take it over and move forward. That's the part I love is just seeing like everybody help me out when I was sick. People are still helping me out today when I'm not sick, which is awesome. And seeing that team come together. So, you know, in the future where, you know, we hope Roblox is successful and we have that big IPO or whatever we may do, the stories aren't going to be told about, you know, IPv6 or, or 64-bit OSs or whatnot. It's going to be about how the team came together. And so that's why I love this picture here. This was me and another engineer, Victor. He's that works on the, <clears throat> on the platform team. He helped me solve a bunch of configuration elements. And this is the very first game that we rent and ran on Linux. And it was just super exciting to see because again, like it's not just like starting a container, it's the entire life cycle of the platform, how everything connects. It was just such a victorious moment. I stood up and it was just awesome to see that. So uh, the story here again is like, you know, you can come together with your teams to be able to solve interesting and challenging problems. And this is something what I love is again, you know, millions of kids are playing this, you know, they don't know what a Linux is or they don't, you know, is that a cough medicine or something like they can just play, they have fun, we're building containers and, and throwing them out there. One other good stat is I think every day we cycle through about two million containers that we build, destroy. Um, that has given us some different challenges for performance and long-term issues with like some memory management because I mentioned that C group memory issue. I believe that's still an, an issue and we're looking at like kernel 5.3 to be able to fix it. But again, like working with partners like Canonical, we're able to be able to you know, come together and figure out a, a great solution for us overall. So if you want to know more, uh, you can check us out on GitHub for the uh, Terraform provider. Uh, just slash Roblox and then search for mass and you can find it from there. I gave a little bit more of a detailed talk around this through, with Portworks and so they have a good webinar write up, uh, write up about that. So uh, I went over just a few of the cool things that we've done here. Um, you know, I've now shifted off of this project as of like February, March as primary. I'm now primarily doing traffic engineering, so some BPF stuff was really awesome to see today. Um, so we're always hiring and looking at uh, you know solving new and big interesting problems. So if it's something you're interested, you know, hit us up on LinkedIn. Try to hit me up. I'm not really that great around social media stuff anymore with uh, SLAs, but you know, love to have those communications and those chats because I truly believe that infrastructure is not a problem for Roblox. It is not a problem for company X. It's a global problem that we all need to come together and solve. And that's why I love all of the work of like Cloud Native Foundation work, all these things like us coming together to do it. For me in my life, like Linux has been the most transformational technology that's powered me and en enabled my career. And again, that couldn't have uh, happened without millions of developers and coming together to be able to create that solution over the last 20, 25 years. So appreciate it. I want to appreciate and thank everybody for coming and then appreciate all of the sponsors for today. And uh, thanks for everything. Appreciate it.